No Place Like Oz, Chapter 10 The next morning, the Scarecrow and I stepped out of the mansion into a bright and breezy day. Every ear of corn and every wildflower glistened and sparkled in the sun, and I took a deep breath, inhaling dewy morning air. It smelled like just-baked cookies. When I looked closely, I saw that the air was filled with thousands of specks floating in the breeze like dandelion fuzz. The difference was that these specks were silvery and slippery, flying through the air like tiny beads of mercury from a broken thermometer. One of them landed gently on my face. When I crossed my eyes to look at it, I was shocked to see a dainty little person with butterfly wings and a wild tuft of silver hair sit sitting right on top of my nose, without as much as a, hel as a hello. Oh, don't mind them, the scarecrow said. It's pixie season. They can be quite irritating, but they're harmless. Just as he said it, the creature sh sank its sharp little teeth into my nose. I was more surprised than actually hurt, but I screamed, swatting at it and spinning around in a circle trying to get it off me. The pixie jumped from my face and buzzed around my head, letting out a high-pitched st staccato squeal. She was laughing at me. Uh, mostly harmless, the scarecrow said. I don't remember those things from last time, I said, rubbing at my in injury to check for blood. They stayed in their hives by back in those days, he, he explained. They were afraid of the witches, but Ozma believes in letting them run wild, and they've been getting bolder and bolder. You should see what they do to my cornfields. I'm all for pixies having their freedom, I sniffed. I'm an American, after all. But they might be a little more graceful to the girl who gave it to them, don't you suppose? All the magic in the world couldn't give a pixie manners, the scarecrow said ruefully. If I were king, I'll do away with all of them. But Ozma is of the opinion that even Oz's lowest creatures deserve their freedom. Pixies, screaming trees, even gnomes, for heaven's sakes. They all flourish under Princess's rule. They might have been rude, but I couldn't help but being charmed as I watched the little things flittering through the air. I hope they at least do pretty little spells or something, I said, to make up for the nasty, the nastiness and biting. They certainly do. If you catch one, they'll grant you exactly one wish, the scarecrow said. Oh, I exclaimed. Then what are we waiting for? I was about to go chasing after the pixie who had bit me. It would serve her right. But the scarecrow caught me by the elbow. Don't bother, he said. You can only wish for three things, and none of them are very interesting. A dried cod, a hunk of coal, or a darning kit. Aunt Em might like a darning kit, I said, but I quickly dropped my chase. That's when I saw a carriage sitting by the road of yellow brick, a vehicle that would put Henry Ford's finest automobile to shame. It was a jeweled green sphere of glass etched with delicate swirling patterns, but about as big as Uncle Henry's tool shed, and, a rather, and rather than having a wheel that was hovering in the air a few feet off the ground, it was hitched to a crude wooden horse composed of log a log sitting on top of four sturdy sticks. It had two knots for eyes, and a notch for a mouth, and a twig for a tail. Hello there, the log said. By now, I knew not to be surprised by anything around here, especially not a talking log in the shape of a horse. Well, hello there, I greeted him. If you could call a log a him. I'm Dorothy Gale. Pleased to meet you. He turned toward me and whinnied. I'm the sawhorse, he said. The fastest horse in all of Oz, of course and the captain of Ozma's royal guard. I'll get you to the Emerald City in no time at all. Just then, Toto came racing out of the house, followed by Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, who were looking around in a daze, like they hadn't really expected any of all any of this to be true. Toto began barking and leaping into the air, trying to catch the pixies who di dipped and dove around him, taunting him with their squeaky giggles. I hope he liked dry cod. Aunt Em, I called. Uncle Henry, the scarecrow is going to take us to the Emerald City. Isn't the carriage marvelous? It looks like a big Fabergé egg, Aunt Em said. I always found them to be a bit gaudy myself. But I could tell from the way she was staring that she was more impressed than she cared to admit. The Emerald City? Uncle Henry asked. I thought we were going to find your friend Glinda. We're going to meet with Ozma, I said, trying to be to reassure him. She's the Princess of Oz. She helped us find Glinda. Besides, don't you want to see the magnificent Emerald City? And the Scarecrow was extremely diplomatic about the whole thing. You can't come all the way to Oz and miss out on the Emerald City, he said. When my aunt and uncle looked at him dubiously, he added, The princess is a formidable magic user in her own right. If she can't send you home herself, she will no doubt be eager to help you find the sorceress. It took a little convincing, but eventually they gave in, and soon Uncle Henry was helping Aunt Emma to the carriage. At least we had a ride this time. I think after yesterday's ordeals, we were all more than happy to be traveling in comfort. The inside of the carriage was lined with 
plush and velvet cushions. In the scarecrow and I sat on one side, and my aunt and uncle on the other. A tea service floated on a tray between us. Tea? The scarecrow asked Aunt M, handing her a pink cup. She looked like she wanted to say no, but Aunt M can never resist a good cup of tea. Do you have Earl Grey? she asked. I have whatever you'd like, he replied. He pointed at the kettle on the tray. How do I brew it? she asked curiously. Just pour it and imagine the best cup of tea you can think of. Aunt M looked dubious, but she gingerly poured herself a serving, and then she took a sip. Her eyes lit up. That's Earl Grey, all right, she said in delight, and then curiously. Did you cast a spell on it? The scarecrow chortled. A spell? I should think not. I'm a man of science. In fact, it's the milk of the rare chimera. While it remains inside the kettle, it exists in infinite liquid forms. It's not until you pour it that it takes out the qualities you desire of it. Does it serve up scotch, too? Uncle Henry joked. I don't see why not, the scarecrow said. Soon my uncle was contently tipping his favorite ginvalet vintage, and I had poured myself a cup of rich, dark, cho hot chocolate. And we were off. The carriage shot forward down the road like a bolt of lightning. Scenery was whipping past us in a green and gold blur. But we were perfectly comfortable inside our cozy little bubble. Every time we curved into a hairpin turn or went speeding down a hill, our vehicle would adjust itself so that we didn't even shift in our seats. Henry Ford could take a lesson from whoever built this, Uncle Henry marveled, gazing out the window. Outside the carriages, carriage, forest, village, and rivers all appeared and disappeared as quickly as they popped into sight, while the sawhorse sped ahead, moving with each speed that his wooden feet didn't make as much as a sound against the brick road. He really is fast, I say to Scarecrow. He is indeed. He claims to be the fastest horse in the land, and I don't doubt him. He's also Ozma's co closest confidant, you know. He's been with her the longer than anyone. He is the one who brought her back to the city after her exile, and he's been her most loyal servant ever since. It almost made me sorry for Ozma to think that her only friend was a wooden horse that looked more like a piece of scrap lumber than an animal. Even Miss Millicent had to make a better friend than a talking log jammed together with a few twigs. When he was certain that Aunt Em and Uncle Henry weren't paying attention, he wrapped he wrapped up as if they were in their own conversation and in watching the scenery. The scarecrow put his arm around me casually and leaned in close, whispering, Be careful what you say in the sawhorse's presence. Rest assured that anything you tell him will find its way to the princess's ear. I nodded slowly, not sure what to make of any of it. After a bit, the sawhorse began to slow his pace, and I saw that we came to a wide river. Oh dear, the scarecrow said. Isn't this always the way? It's the wandering river. What's that? Am asked nervously. Just another of Munchkin Country's many nuisances, the Scarecrow exclaimed with a wave of his stuffed hand. If it's anything like the Forest of Fear, I'm turning back now, Henry said firmly, and Emily is coming with me. I didn't speak up, but I had to agree that after yesterday, we had all had more than our fill of Oz's alter alternative annoyances. Not to worry, the Scarecrow said. The wandering water isn't unpleasant, just inconvenient. It's a river with a mind of its own, you see. You can never tell where it's going to find it, where you're going to find it. In a few hours, it will have moved to somewhere else entirely. Never fear, though. The road isn't without its own personality. It will get us across in just a little delay, in little delay as possible. As we galloped toward the water, I saw that this scare, what the scarecrow meant. The river was actually moving, shifting and undulating, snaking its way across the landscape, paying no attention to the fact that it cut right through the middle of the road, leaving no way to cross. But as we approached, the road of yellow brick began reconfiguring itself, too. As if it sensed us coming, golden bricks began to float into the air, one by one, constructing themselves into a curving bridge that led high up into the sky, where it took a meandering, circulated route across the water. The only problem was it didn't look very stable. We're not going over that, are we? Aunt Em asked, craning her neck out the window and turning a shade of pale green. Oh yes, the scarecrow said. Not to worry, though. The sawhorse has never lost a passenger. Soon we're trotting upward toward into the clouds, the river hundreds of feet below us. The bridge of yellow bricks continued building itself as we made our way across it, fluttering in a breeze like a ribbon. Aunt Em's eyes were squeezed shut, and her knuckles were white. Her hands clasped together in her lap. Uncle Henry gripped her arm tight, not looking much braver than she did. Back in Kansas, I'd never been so much for heights myself, but now that I was in Oz, I discovered that I didn't care. It was part of the adventure. Why come to a place like this and then turn away in the secret thing that the secret things it has to offer you? So as we climbed higher and higher into the sky, I forced myself to keep my eyes open. All of Oz was spread out below us like patchwork quilts. 
When they squinted, I almost thought I could see the red towns of Quadling Country to the south and the yellow hills of Leaky Territory to the west. The purple Gilkin Mountain Range stretched north as far as I can see. That is until I saw the Emerald City glowing in the horizon, and I forgot everything else. I would never forget that glittering skyline. From high above the wandering water, the city appeared. First as a green glimmer against the blue sky, and then popped into focus, rippling like a mirage beyond the massive glass wall that rose over the trees. The curved rooftops of the skyline blended into each other in a series of sloping gentle waves, all surrounded by a halo of light. In the center of it all, the pointed sp spires of the palace rose straight into the air, scraping the clouds. I wondered what it'd be like to stand on the top of one of those towers and look over all of Oz. I wondered how far you could see from them. I wondered what it'd be like to know that all of this magic was yours. Did Ozma appreciate what she'd been given? I hope she did. If I had all that, I would never let myself lose sight of how lucky I was. Not for one moment.